I need some traction. You need some traction. Thanks, folks, for uh, having me. First time to Vancouver. Psyched to be here. It was a tough journey. Left Boston at 2 o'clock yesterday. I got here two hours ago, and I did not drive. Uh, so it was an uh, interesting journey, but I'm psyched to be here, here for the afternoon and the evening. I'll see you at the reception and everything. I'm psyched to catch up and do a brain dump for 20 minutes on sales acceleration. So the um, unorthodox thing about my journey was um, I have, I have a, a different background than most sales leaders. I started my career writing code. Um, I studied engineering in undergrad. I've got a degree from MIT. Uh, so I've always had this lens of data and science and technology through which I viewed the world. And it was that lens that I applied to building and scaling a sales team. I was very blessed and lucky that 10 years ago when I started doing this, uh, the market was sort of ripe for this type of innovation with big data and technology and SaaS and subscription revenue coming in the market and more sales teams moving inside, it was sort of ripe for this perspective to come in and innovate some of the best practices in sales. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so we're going to start out with, uh, I wrote this mission when I first took the role 10 years ago, predictable, scalable revenue growth. And if you ever go out and raise venture capital, start your sales and marketing deck slides with these four words. All the VCs love it. They, they nudge the partner, they're like, oh, this is exactly what we've been looking for. This guy's great, right? So the meat and potatoes, though, behind these words is what really matters, and there's four things. The first thing is, how can I hire the same successful salesperson every time? How can I train them to be aligned with today's modern buyer? How can I provide them with the same quality and quantity of leads? And how, I can, how can I hold them accountable to working those leads with the same sales process? We'll spend five minutes with about each, each one of these points. So the first important question is hiring. Right? And I ask myself, a lot of people say, Mark, what do you look for in a salesperson? This is so key to our success. It's a very, very difficult question, probably the most critical one in building a sales and marketing function and scaling your revenue. And I asked this question to 30 VPs of sales the first year I took the job. And I learned the hard way that there's not an easy answer to this. And I remember the eighth hire I made, first year, I convinced the number one salesperson at a public company in Boston to come join our company. We were literally 12 people in a garage. No one had heard of us. Somehow I convinced this person to come. Number one out of 800 people. And I roll out the red carpet and I say, welcome to HubSpot, teach us to sell. And to my surprise, they didn't crush it. I mean, they didn't do poorly, but they didn't crush it either. And I scratched my head on that one. It's like, how could this person who came from this huge organization not come here and, and teach us how to sell? And I realized they came from such a different context than us. Big public company, literally running Super Bowl ads. It took a minute to explain the product and five minutes to close a deal. And that was the complete opposite of what was going on at HubSpot at the time. We call up and say, hey, it's Mark from HubSpot. They say, what's HubSpot? We say, it's inbound marketing. We sell inbound marketing software. What's inbound marketing? What's well, about building content to attract Visitors to your website and convert them to leads. Wow, that sounds cool. How do you do it? And it was just this big, long evangelistic sell. And you can imagine the person that was succeeding in that public company environment on the sales side would be really, really different than the person that was succeeding in the evangelistic entrepreneurial environment that we had at the time. So at that point, I concluded there really is no ideal sales hiring formula that exists for every single company. But there is a process to engineer it. And I'm amazed at how few early stage ventures take the time to do that. It's such a simple process. And you'll be sitting there like, duh, but ask yourself, do you really do it? And what I did was I just, I wrote down the eight to 10 criteria that I thought would correlate with success within HubSpot sales environment. And I clearly defined with two or three sentences what each one was and what a score of a one, a three, a five, a seven, a 10 would feel like as we assess these people. And I was disciplined around having myself and our hiring managers assess every candidate and especially every hire against that criteria. And even if you're only hiring a half a dozen salespeople this year, it's extraordinarily interesting to see them evolve your company for four to six months and either become rock stars or duds and to be able to look back and say, could we have caught this? What is contributing to their success or failure? And are we properly assessing them on that criteria? And it actually wasn't long, probably about 18 months, where I had enough data to run a regression analysis against that information. And this was the first regression analysis on our hiring formula. And obviously, the, the characteristics with the big blue lines to the right are most strongly, were most strongly correlated back in the day, and the ones with the blue lines to the left were negatively correlated. And what was really interesting to me 
with, with this analysis was, at the time, everybody was talking about this new transformative sales and marketing and all this kind of stuff and buyer empowerment. And for the first time, this was stats kind of speaking to me that we were demanding a different type of seller from our companies, right? Because when I think about uh, a generic salesperson, like a car salesperson, and how I might describe them, things like closing ability, convincing, objection handling, they were actually negatively correlated to success in our environment. And when I think about a great coach or a consultant, someone, something like preparation, adaptability, intelligence, those are the most strong correlators to success. So this analysis is really eye-opening to me around the type of people I wanted to find and the type of sales culture I wanted to build. Right? So it, after years of doing this, we would redo this regression analysis every six months, and I encourage you to get into some sort of cadence to always reflect on your hiring successes and failures. And uh, there were five criteria that correlated most strongly for us over the years. And I do find that they correlate often in many early stage ventures because of the context, especially on the tech and software side. Um, so these three were all in the top five. I want you guys to tell me which one was number one. So how many people think intelligence was the number one correlator to success in the HubSpot environment? How about coachability? How many people think it was coachability? We got about 20% of the room. How many think it was curiosity? That's the one that always gets me. I thought so too, but it was coachability. That was number one. In fact, coachability was not even in my first list of theories. It took a couple years of me watching people that were amazing hires that I thought, and they didn't work out. And the pattern was that they said, you know, Mark, thank you for the coaching and the training, but I know how to sell. I've been in sales for many years. I'll be over at my desk doing my thing. And for whatever reason, those are the people that didn't work out for us. So I, I, I measure closely, assess very closely coachability, and these are the five, coachability, curiosity, intelligence, work ethic, and prior success, in order of how strongly correlated in our environment. Okay, so let's move on to training. If I gave everybody in the room a red pen and said, circle the salesperson, who would they circle? The good-looking, money-hungry young man or the helpful young lady? Would it be the sleazy cigar smoker or the intelligent thought leader? How about the selfish devil or the prescriptive doctor? Right? It's like, how did this happen that 100 years ago we invented this field, sales, that was supposed to go out in the market and represent our companies with our prospective customers, the people we were trying to, to become customers of our business. And yet today, when I do a Google search, all the pictures on the left of selfishness, money-hungry, sleazeballs are found on the first page of Google Images. And none of the pictures on the right of helpful, prescriptive, intelligent individuals are found. And my question is, is this sustainable? Is this the era that it actually changes? Do we as buyers, are we empowered that we're like, enough, I'm not gonna deal with it anymore? And who do you wanna buy from if you go and engage with a software organization or startup? And who do you want selling for you? Right, so are we in this realm where we have to kind of rethink and transform traditional sales? I absolutely think we are. And I think there's two important steps to be able to do that. I think that the modern seller, the best analogy is that doctor. Right? Like, when I go to the doctor's office and she's like, Mark, do you smoke or do you have heart disease in your family? I don't lie, I tell the truth. Right? Because I see the diploma on the wall and I know that she has my best interest in mind. She's just trying to diagnose my situation so she can prescribe me the right pills. And when she says, this is what you have, take these pills, I'm not like, let me think about it or can I have 20% off? Right? <laughs> I take the pills. Right? And this is how, this is the model that we have to kind of be thinking about for our sales teams. So to make this transformation, the two things that I like people to focus on is number one, build your sales process with the buyer in mind first. I know that's been a trend from a different lenses today, but always think about how your buyer buys your product, the steps they go through, and then layer on top of that how you want your salespeople to act. And then, number two, personalize the entire experience to those sellers' context. Right? So, um, just to give you an example, I'll go and do some advisement at lots of different startups, and they'll be like, Mark, you know, we love your metrics-driven sales approach. We created a sales process. I'm like, oh, that's great, great start. Tell me about the sales process. There's four steps. Number one, we prospect. Number two, we qualify. Number three, we demo. Number four, we close. Pretty common. I've never met a buyer who wanted to be prospected to, qualified, demoed, or closed. <laughs> right? So instead, what I encourage you is think about it from the buyer's perspective. Something like uh, awareness, consideration, decision. It's really kind of generically three things that we go through. 
And then layer on top of that how salespeople can identify the people who are aware of, the, are becoming aware of the problems we solve. They can connect with those folks, not with like that generic elevator pitch that they use for everybody, asking them if they want to see a demo. That's not appropriate for the stage they're at in the buying journey. But instead, maybe some educational information like an ebook or a blog article, even if you didn't even write it, your company didn't write it, as the call to action. Maybe spending some time on a consultation to discuss that problem, not see a product. And then to be able to explore exactly how they're thinking about that problems and maybe help them frame that, that problem a little bit more crisply, because we deal with that every day. And then advise them on the right solution, whether it's our solution or someone else's. These are some examples of how we can build this process in a more modern way and train our folks around it. All right, let's talk about demand generation. How many people in the room in the last six months have received a cold call at the office from a telemarketer, you got into an engaging conversation with that telemarketer, and you ended up buying their product? Usually there's like 1%. Someone called me recently. They said, Mark, do you have a crack in your windshield? I said, no, they hung up the phone. That's what someone's job is today. <laughs> That's what we should do. That's what we should do at HubSpot. We should just call all you guys and say, do you need more leads? You're like, no, we just hang up the phone. That's the approach. How many people in the last six months have received a piece of uh, direct mail at your office or a cold email to your inbox? You opened it, you were engaged, you loved it, and you ended up buying the product. OK, we got 1% or so. How many people in the last six months have uh, had a problem? You went online to research that problem, whether it's on Google or social media, and that research led to buying a product. All right, so now we're up to like 80%. Not a very you know, thought-provoking survey these days, but 10 years ago it was. What's more interesting, you know, clearly we as buyers are more empowered, and that applies to the marketing side as well, that you know, not only do we uh, uh, you know, want to consume and, uh, and sort of ignore the outbound typical ways of getting in touch with people, we actually have tools to keep this noise out. We have email blockers that are getting smarter and smarter about keeping email out. In the states, I know we have the do not call list. Um, you know, we're, we're constantly trying to avoid this interruptive type marketing. But if I flip the, the switch here and asked you, look at your sales and marketing budgets for 2016. And how much are you spending on cold calling and advertising versus content production? And so even though this is so intuitive to us, we as human beings, we're just slow to change. And I think part of it is we just don't know what to do. I've got CEOs that come up to me after, like, Mark, that was so thought-provoking. I'm going to start blogging once a week. Thank you so much. I'm like, no, you're not. They're like, what do you mean? I thought that was the whole point. Yeah, but you're a busy CEO. How many hours do you work? 70 hours a week? And now you're going to layer blogging on top of that? We have to think about creating a content production process. And very few people realize that the journalist is at the center of this process. The journalists hold the keys to the future of sales and marketing, to the future of demand generation. And we realize this, we can rethink the way we kind of build our demand generation processes. The second hire we made at HubSpot when we were 12 people, second hire in our marketing team, was a reporter from the New York Times. Right? This is how aggressive we need to get as marketers. And the good news for you, bad news for them, is their industry is not exactly on fire. Right? The newspaper and magazine industries are not crushing it today. And what you're left with is a number of extremely gifted individuals out there that are looking to transform their careers and help them put one and two together and engage with those, whether they're freelancers or college interns or really gifted full-time employees. Right? Now, once you find these people, don't over-obsess about their grasp of your domain. That's your job as the CEO, as the C-suite, as the salespeople. You know your domain. You know the questions that your buyers are asking and how to answer them. Your journalist's job is to sit down and interview. Once a week, 9 a.m. on a Friday, they sit down with one of you on the Thought Leadership Committee and interview, interview for an hour on a question that often comes up. Right? And from that one-hour interview, they can create a five-page ebook. They can create four blog articles. They can create a couple dozen social media messages just from that one-hour interaction. It might take them two days of effort, but it's just one hour of your time. And they can schedule those social media messages over the course of the month, each one pointing back to the relevant blog article. And most importantly, at the bottom of the blog article is a call to action that says, did you like this blog on XYZ? Maybe you'll like the five-page ebook we wrote on the same subject. Click here. And a lot of people will click, and they'll find out the ebook is free. I just need your name, phone number, and email address, and it's yours. And that simple process, again, that leveraged one hour of your time, maybe once every six weeks, and, and two, in two days of a very economic, efficient resource, and the journalist produces a really nice following on your blog and social media, 
high Google ranks with lots of inbound traffic, and a high conversion rate from visitor to lead, so you have qualified leads for your, pro for your salespeople. Okay. All right, and then let's end up with, um, OK, five minutes, thank you. Um, number four is how can you hold the people accountable to working those leads in the same sales process? Right, and this comes down to the sales manager. I wish I can rename the role of the sales manager sales coach because it's the most important thing that they do. And it's probably the biggest driver outside of sales hiring, once you get them in, your ability to develop them continuously is what drives sales acceleration and productivity of your company. And let's talk about what co good coaching is. Let me use an analogy in golf, a game I've tried to learn for 15 years. And I've taken a couple lessons. One golf pro said, Mark, take a swing, and I did. And he said, OK, turn your grip over a little bit. Lean back in your stance. Put more uh, weight in your right foot, not your left. Think 1 o'clock, not 2 o'clock in the back swing, and give me more wrist on contact. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Right? Another pro said, Mark, take a swing, and I did. And he said, here, try this grip. Now take 100 swings with that grip. 20 minutes later, he's like, how's that feel? I was like, that feels pretty good. He's like, now try leaning back in your stance a bit. Take another 100 swings. How's that feel? That feels pretty good. Really simple example, but I've promoted 18 sales reps to managers, and all of them start coaching like the first golf pro. They get a, a new salesperson on the team, and they see the 50 things that are broken with them, and they throw up on them for 90 minutes on this feedback. <laughs> and you can just see the salesperson's head spinning, and nothing gets done. But the best coaches and the best managers see the 50 things, but they know the one or two that are going to make the biggest impact on that rep's performance today. And they do that diagnosis using metrics. I call that metrics-driven sales coaching. All right, so let's do a quick example. Here is a sales team. Each color is a different rep. And we've got a really basic sales funnel. At the very top, we've got a bunch of leads that are being sourced, a bunch of leads that are worked, and demo, convert to demos and convert to revenue at the bottom. And we've got conversion rates across each. So if I was the coach of the purple person at the top, if I didn't have the metrics, I guarantee you 99% of sales managers would say, they just need to make more calls. It's not the case. They're second on the team in calls, really good. Their problem is getting those calls into demos and also getting them into revenue. So I want to start toward the top. That's where they're kind of most broken. So let's work on the leads work to demo. Making a bunch of calls, not getting the demos. Now my first instinct is, can I learn more by digging into the data? And here I can, right? Because I can look at, well, they're making a bunch of calls, but do they actually get them on the phone? Or do they get them on the phone, but they don't actually get them to take the next step and want them to spend more time with them? And this is important because my coaching is way different. If they get them on the phone, if they can't get them on the phone, I have to look at the quality of their emails and voicemails and the frequency and the depth. But if they get them on the phone and can't get into the demo, I have to look at how they're breaking the ice and building trust and educating those people in those opening minute or two that are so crucial. Right? So my coaching is going to be way different, and I want to lean into the metrics. Okay, so hopefully a couple of th thoughts for you guys to think of. Two things, we have a free CRM. Any users of our free CRM out there, great. We launched it two years ago. It's been on fire. Check it out. I also spent about 80 hours this winter building an inbound sales methodology that is free for you to watch. It's about six hours of classes, all split into 30 minutes. And uh, you can just Google uh, HubSpot sales certification, and you'll find that class in the relevant section you want. Also, I wrote a book about this whole process. It's done very well. 100% of the proceeds go to build.org. Anyone involved in build? Awesome org for you guys to know. They've picked, uh, I think they're in four cities now, started in San Francisco, they're in Boston, maybe Chicago, New York. They picked the worst neighborhoods in these cities where the kids just haven't been dealt the deck that we probably have in our childhood. And they're probably going to end up on the streets or something. They teach them entrepreneurship in freshman year. And it's a four-year program where they start their own company. And by the time junior, senior year rolls around, they're selling those, those products. They have a 99% graduation rate from high school, a matriculation rate, I think 85% matriculation rate into college, which, believe me, is way different than the average for those high schools. So they're expanding next year. Check out that organization as well, build.org. Thanks for your time. I need some traction.